Hi, I'm Jody Cohn, your host, and I'm so honored to be joined by Andrea Nakayama, an internationally known functional medicine nutritionist, educator, and speaker who is leading a movement to transform the health industry into a system that works, empowering patients and practitioners alike with systems and tools of functional nutrition. Andrea is celebrated as a leader in the field of functional nutrition because of her unique ability to teach and inspire practitioners and patients alike. Andrea synthesizes art and science, empathy and physiology, intuition and problem solving into a system that truly helps people get to the root cause of their illness, create a path toward wellness and find their way back to life. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Jody. I'm excited to be with you. I know this is a topic that we both sadly know a little too much about. True. So I would, I would love it if you would first share your definition of resilience. Mm, it's, it's an interesting one to define because I think people often put it in opposition to stress, right? It's like this balancing scale between stress and resilience. And even on the functional nutrition matrix, stress and resilience have their key place. But I think of resilience as the practices and what we do to give ourselves the foundation to weather all that life brings us. And um, before I go on, I will say like, I've loved this word and this concept for so long. And I tend to study a lot of concepts outside of our industry. And resilience is a concept that's looked at by mechanical engineers, by architects in medicine. It's that ability to uh, run to the site of a crime or a, uh, you know, something tragic and then recover. It's what our animals do when they sleep after being caught in a tree or under a car. It's what bridges have to do to stay up and really withstand the weight that's put on them. So resilience for me is all the things, all the practices. It's every part of our physiology, our psychology, and how we tend to ourselves to weather all that comes our way. I love that definition. That's my favorite so far. Very inclusive. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know how succinct it was, but <laughs> there it is. It's all the things. Well, no, and, and, and I'd love to get into kind of the functional nutrition matrix, but first for people who don't know your story, would you mind kind of sharing your own journey? Yeah, so uh, the biggest part of my story that people often ask about has to do with the death, the illness and the death of my husband. And when I was seven weeks pregnant in April of 2000, he was diagnosed with a very aggressive brain tumor, a glioblastoma multiforme, and given about six months to live at the age of diagnosis, he was 31. Um, almost 32. And so while I was growing a baby, he was fighting a brain tumor and he lived two and a half years. And we had to learn a lot of new practices, make a lot of shifts, unlearn a lot of things, build a lot of resilience and um, really learn, unlearn all the things in a grave situation at a young age. He did, like I said, live two and a half years. We did all the things. We did so much to support him. He wasn't expected to see our son born, but they did have a year and a half together, good imprinting. Isamu, my husband, died in July of 2002. And then I had a whole new journey, as you know, to learn living without the love of my life, the father of my child, and grow from there. And so that's its own resilience practice and honestly, like it doesn't end. Also, as you as you know, it's it's a journey of resilience forevermore. Yeah, and I'm curious, like going back to that moment and and being given that news. Like, how does one? People always ask me, like, how are you still standing? How did you not fall apart? And that's what I'm actually trying to deconstruct and, and share, so that other people can, you know. Ha have better tools, be, be able to move forward. So I'm curious, what, what helped you? 
Yeah, I think this is where the matrix is so helpful for me because it is all the things and the functional nutrition matrix is a tool that I teach into and I use and it really helps us understand our store. What I like to say is our story, our soup and our skills, right? So our story is everything from our genetics to the triggers in our lives to what we know helps us and what doesn't. The soup is everything going on physiologically and the skills are those practices the things we do. And it's really all the things. Again, it's having love. It's having family and support. It's uh, knowing that we were in it together and really going through all the steps. It's hope for the future. I was growing our baby. It's um, taking on practices that we know will support our longevity. There's genetics involved in our resilience. Some of us are set up to have more wherewithal to weather some of these storms. I am, but you know, our genes aren't our destiny as we all know, even if we have genes that make us more susceptible to depression or anxiety or mood swings or ADD, we can have an influence on those. But I am fortunate to be of a hardy stock that can weather you know, crises. How do people make it through the Holocaust? How do people make it through the many Holocausts? How do people make it through the many social injustices? And um, I like to think of it as post-traumatic growth versus post-traumatic stress because I had the foundation and a lot of that is love to be able to move forward and see possibility beyond the impossible, as you've experienced, Jody, it seems impossible. And for people looking from the outside in, it's how could you still be standing? And for you, it's how could I not? I do it in his honor. I do it for my daughter. There's so many reasons to keep standing that we can't crumble under the, um, under the stress, which, you know, is being presented. Yeah. And I, I'd love to unpack that a little bit, starting with story. And I, what you kind of are alluding to is the why, why, you know, like on those days when I didn't want to get out of bed, why did I do it anyway? Cause my daughter, right. cause she needed me. So if, I'm sorry, <laughs> if, okay. you, if you, it really, well, and I think, uh, you know, a friend of mine was saying, um, you know, it, with the thousands of patient, patients that she's now worked with, the ones that have the mindset, the ones that have decided that even on days when it feels hard, when they don't want to do things, they're still going to do it. Those are the ones that see progress. And I, I suspect that this gets into the story component. So I'd love for you to elaborate on that. Yeah, mindset is a huge component. And it doesn't mean that we have to enter into this realm of toxic positivity where it's all going to be okay, right? <laughs> like we have to be able to feel the grief and the loss. And grief and loss can come from making a dietary change, like a darn, I can't eat my grandmother's soup anymore, right? Like it can come in all sorts of ways and we have to honor that for ourselves and as clinicians for the people that we work with and understand that like change and transition are a part of the journey. And yet seeing hope and possibility is something that uh, helps us. It's a mediator in our story. It's something that helps us to move forward and it does a tremendous amount um, in terms of nourishing our body and our soul and our mind. It, to me, nutrition isn't just about the food we eat. I always like to say we're not just what we eat, what, we're what our body can do with what we eat. So that's the physiological part. But nutrition is also hope. It's joy. It's love. It's all these places where there might be deficiencies that we often overlook in favor of the perfect diet or the perfect protocol or the right supplements. And again, it's all of the things and that mindset, it's a piece of the story. It's a piece of our internal physiology. It impacts ourselves as we know with Bruce Lipton's work and the biology of belief. And it is a huge component of our resilience. It's how we manage stress. I'd love to delve into hope a little bit because optimism is a trait of resilience, but that was what 
Early on, I needed a role model that gave me hope. And that was why I avoided um, group therapy because everyone was so stuck in it still. And, and that was, it was very clear to me and it took me a while to find them, but I'm curious if you can kind of elaborate on hope and what that does and how it supports us. Yeah, hope is huge, again, in terms of the cellular recovery and in terms of what's bathing our cells and helping us to move forward. I'm curious who your role models were. I actually didn't feel like I had a role model. Being a widow at such a young age, I definitely felt other. And I had to recognize the ways in which, you know, I'd show up at preschool and people would be like, Gilbert's dad is, and I'd say, dad, you know, like, and so would he, you know, it was just this, we were people's worst nightmare. Yes. Right. It's like, you're walking around and you're the sore thumb because you're making people uncomfortable just with your story. I almost wanted to be around the older women who had lost spouses. I wanted our marking that would have them recognize me, that when I was alone with my kid on my hip, that they could recognize and put their arms around me. But that wasn't the circles I was in. And we don't have those markings for better or worse that would help me identify with my, with my people, with the people who may know uh, a part of my loss. And so my hope came through my connection to Isamu and really knowing what I was looking at and building in his name, in his wake, so to speak. So how was I carrying forward what he had brought out in me? And so the hope had to come really internal for me in finding, um, you know, I always share the story of, I remember thinking like, but who am I? Because Isamu brought out the best in me. And then slowing that down and saying, wait a minute, if he brought out the best in me, it's in me. And so how do I live that reality that he brought out in me? And I think, you know, whether it's our long lost grandparents or the person who really saw us and made us feel something, for me, that resilience and that hope comes internal versus some idea of what things are going to be like tomorrow or the next day or in 10 years. And so hope for me was, um, you know, an inner game. And I know that that, again, nourishes us cellularly so deeply and helps us live into more of our true potential, which also is a component of resilience when we're in our truth, we're living our truth, not some idea of what we're supposed to be for the rest of the world. Yeah, and that you're really getting into a great topic, which is boundaries. And that that really surprised me how people that I really thought would show up, I made totally uncomfortable or um, if I was, you know, like Max died right before Carly started high school and she needed a couple of things. So we went shopping and I posted a photo of us shopping and so many people felt the need to uh, criticize me for doing yeah. that. Like, how, how dare you be happy? How, yes. how dare you do something that's like not sobbing on your floor? And I, I was so surprised by that. Yeah. And that, that, that was really, I, I got very clear that I can't, I have enough on my plate. I can't have the people rooting against me in my life. So exactly. I had to clean house. Yeah. Um, but you asked, the role model thing was hard. I, I kind of started, a friend sent me this book, Bird, um, Rare Bird, a mm -hmm. woman who lost a 12 year old son, kind of mm. same, similar story. So I reached out to her, she was lovely. And then I slowly, people started to connect me with other mothers who, and it needed to be a very specific kind of mother, like a mother who lost a child who was still choosing to show up and be positive, who was not going to be a puddle. Yeah, that's that's actually a really amazing point to show up and be positive and be there for your other child. And I think that um, when Isamu died and Gilbert was just 19 months old 
and he's, you know, 20 now. But when, <laughs> when in those early days, there was a place in Portland that's now been replicated called the Dougie Center. And the first group that we were put in when Gilbert was three was with parents who had lost a child. So the group was really for the children who had experienced loss. And um, I watched in that room a kind of loss that just made my heart break for the living child who could never make their parent happy enough. And it, you know, a testament to you, Jody, for showing up for your daughter and being able to hold the polarity of loss and love that I think is very difficult for parents who lose a child and is a huge part of resilience. And what I like to think of as the resilience equation, like how do we tap into that love and show it in all its expression while we're also experiencing loss and grief? Well, polarity is the key. It's the and. It's the yes. fact that you can feel immensely sad and still laugh. Yes. You, you can be crying on the inside and smiling on the outside that you, you can, you can do both. Yes. And you don't have to, like, if you're yeah. crying on the inside, you can cry on the outside and you're able to articulate it and love and appreciation at the same time. And I think this is what drew, has drawn me so much to the kind of cases that I worked on as a clinician and then began to teach uh, clinicians to work with those more hard to address cases because they're so so much grief in losing our abilities, in losing our faith in the medical system, which is a yes and. It's a true but partial. It doesn't give us all the answers. So it's something in that grief and that loss and that living and hope that shaped my desire to step into the difficult to hold situations. I remember my uncle saying to me, like, why would you want to work with other people with cancer who may not live, that's such a hard place to be. And for me, there's no grace greater than the journey alongside somebody who is suffering and can be in the wake up of that suffering. I mean, I, I know it's a cliche to say that these challenges can present opportunities, but when you see that human who can embrace that polarity, that is grace, that is life, that is really the, the breath that has so much luminance around it because it's never all good and it never has to be all bad. And we don't know what's coming, which is why we don't know what's coming when we eat breakfast, you know, that's a stress. I always like to teach that like, eating is the biggest stressor on our body on a daily basis. And if we have issues going on physiologically, it can be a bigger stressor. How do we build resilience to the little stressors and the big stressors so that we have that polarity, we can hold that grace and that balancing? Yeah, and I think, I mean, it's interesting that you bring that up because prior to Max dying, I had done a lot of work. My challenge is my liver. I, um, I have phase two methylation challenges. So I did a tremendous amount of work. I tried to process emotions. And I think that it's kind of like the bucket of stressors. You know, if you have too much, anything breaks your back. If you can kind of manage your resilience and replenish with joy as you go, then you, you're better able to navigate, you know, the, the traffic jam, the, you know, I have a teenager, the mood swings, what, whatever yes. is going on. Yes. Um, so I'm wondering if you can kind of speak to that and, and getting back to, sorry, we got into such interesting territory. I know. <laughs> the functional nutritional matrix. We talked a bit about the story. Can you walk yeah. us through the skills and the soup? Yeah, absolutely. So the I have several tools that I use to teach practitioners to kind of step out of the wound and really get into that larger picture. So there are three of my, I have three favorite tools, but the functional nutrition matrix is one of them. And it's easy to find if anybody wants to look at it, it's fxnutrition.com forward slash matrix. You can see the matrix and the left is the story, the center is the soup and the right side is the skill. 
that's kind of how I, I think about it. And we start to map what's going on for an individual. So we're out of the fix it mode and into that bigger picture. And when we're looking at that skill section of the matrix, we really have to have that skill informed by what we learn about the person's story and their soup. So just to break that down, the skills include sleep and relaxation, exercise and movement, nutrition and hydration, stress and resilience, and relationships and networks. And those are our skills, but if we're ignoring what those should be, or if we're ignoring all the other parts in terms of what those should be, we're missing the who. Who are you? What's necessary for you in this moment? What are you capable of? A lot of clinicians are giving people protocols that their bodies are not re resilient enough to handle. Those can be protocols that have to do with detoxification or killing some kind of bug or addressing SIBO. And if we haven't addressed the person's nervous system and their gut function and really building that physiological resilience that's in the center of the matrix before we start doing all the things too fast, we're really building on quicksand and it's actually contributing to the person's stress emotionally and physiologically. If we don't understand that that person's come from a family of trauma or experienced food poisoning or some kind of adverse childhood experience that's really impacted them and we're overriding that in favor of the skills, again, we're adding to the stress, not the resilience. So we build resilience by understanding who are you, Jody? What do I need to know about you in order to help you make the next steps so that I'm not in the bias of a protocol or what I think is right for you to do because I just know because I studied it. What I need to study is you. And that's really the beauty of the functional nutrition matrix. It allows us to separate the problem from the solution. It allows us to really get to those roots and take that pause that is a huge part of transformation. And transformation is a, bu a building of the body and the emotional resilience. And we have to do that so that we have sustainable results. So for me, the matrix is the invitation to stop, assess, pause, and know who and why, as opposed to what. And that's really, I think, something we could all be doing for ourselves. I worry that we're all seeking a quick fix or a fix at all. And that sometimes adds to the stress of what we think we're supposed to be doing or why that's not working for us. And actually, um, you know, in terms of resilience, deteriorates some of what we should be building in that moment. I love everything you said. You know, it's interesting. David Perlmutter talked about, uh, he wrote his second book, um, Brainwash, because you need three things to help people. You need to go to medical school, you need to assess them, and they need to execute it. And he said, step three is where it falls apart. You know, you can't start with diet I think step with people. Two falls apart. <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's why we have you. But yes, but, but for the people that are listening, I think we're so quick to blame ourselves, you know, like, oh, I didn't yes. do it right. Or, oh, I can't, you know, I'm supposed to be gluten-free, but I really like bagels and gosh, I'm just a bad person. I can't, you know, we don't give ourselves a break and give ourselves compassion. We don't realize that, you know, these other factors might be at play. So for, for someone who's listening, who's like, oh God, I would love a better way. I really want results, but I don't quite know, you know, we don't know what we don't know and right. we avoid what we don't know. So can, you know, how would you kind of walk someone through that process so that yes. they're, they know where to, where to put their energy and where to start. Yeah. And this brings me to another one of my models. And I'm, I'm a fan of the mental model and a mental model helps us to solve the most complex problems. If we look back through history, philosophy, any kind of history, there was always a mental model when the problem was very complex and in health and healthcare, we're seeing more and more complex situations. So I have a system that I call the three tiers to nutrition mastery. I like to call it the three tiers to epigenetic 
mastery, but that can be an overwhelming word for some people. So we call it the three tiers to nutrition mastery, but really it is how we take care and control of our own health situation. And I'm going to give you the three tiers and then we're going to talk about tier one. So tier one is, uh, are the non-negotiables. Tier two is deficiency to sufficiency. And tier three is dismantling the dysfunction. What medicine often does is go right to tier three. We dismantle the dysfunction. Oh, I've labeled it. It's SIBO, it's Crohn's, it's Hashimoto's, it's breast cancer. Here's what we do. And in functional nutrition, when we're looking at the terrain in which that problem exists, those roots, not one root, but roots exist in soil, we're saying, what is the situation in which this problem or this diagnosis, this sign, symptom, or diagnosis exists? And how do I shift that and see what shifts by shifting that. So we can absolutely shift a tier three issue by looking at tier one and tier two. We're just not bypassing those in favor of the fix or the band-aid, right? So tier one, those non-negotiables are the things we really have to figure out for ourselves. And that brings us back to that right side of the matrix. What do I know helps me feel better? What makes me feel worse? What do I know? Those are our mediators. So that's a part of our story. I know it makes me feel better when I blah. Just do, do so yoga. It, Walk yeah, my dog. Yeah. Exactly. Eat um, breakfast by this time. Drink my green tea. Whatever it is. Always start my day with water. Whatever it is that you're like, I know these things make me feel better. These are my non-negotiables. Step one is own it. Just know you and that's building your resilience because you know that is a non-negotiable. You may also know that there's things you don't want to give up and say that's a non-negotiable. And if it's something that's harming you in some way, there might be some deeper work to think about risk reward. What is it that I want that for? And is there another way to get that? And how can I do work with somebody around that? But non-negotiables is a huge place to play. And we start thinking through those categories, sleep and relaxation. Do I have non-negotiables? around there? Well, I do. I need to know I get to bed by 10 p.m. If I go later, I know my circadian rhythm is off. I know I'm going to have more cravings the next day. Non-negotiable. I know it. That's it. What about my yoga practice or how I walk or get out in nature? Like those things for me become non-negotiables. So I know we don't have a lot of time, but that's a starting place for all of us that we do have the power to figure out. And if we know there are more non-negotiables that we haven't figured out or haven't figured out how to implement, who can help us to determine what those are based on our unique needs? Not based on a protocol out in the world or in a book or on a summit, right? Like not a protocol, those can help, but how do we get to the depth of our unique needs? I love that because that's so empowering for people. I think so often we we give our power away or, you know, like this, <clears throat> when your life falls apart, you can't please other people. You just don't have the bandwidth. Right. And, and that's when you realize how much energy you put into pleasing other people. Yeah, so true. So true. And that self-empowerment is a huge piece of our resiliency. It's a huge piece of going like, oh my God, I have, like, I have agency. I don't need the doctor to tell me everything. I don't need the expert to tell me everything. I'm the expert of me. You know what the best evidence is? It's the personal evidence. And the more we track and question and say, I don't know, does it work for me to eat gluten-free? Does it work for me to reduce my sugar? Does it work for me? Do I sleep better when I use those oils? And does that help me? We track and we learn and we understand and we go, yes, that I have another non-negotiable. The more I have, the more mediators I know, the more I'm in control of my health. I love the way, I call it personal responsibility, but I really love the way you phrase that. Is there anything else for, for the listeners who might be, you know, you have so many brilliant tools, but just anything else that would empower them with resilience that, you know, is easy to execute. 
Yeah, I want to go to that second tier since we're okay. on those tiers. So deficiency to sufficiency goes the other direction into toxicity, right? So mm. we want that balancing scale of sufficiency. And when we think about this from a nutrition arena, it might we might be thinking of, oh, I have methylation issues, so I have B vitamin deficiencies, or I have glutathione deficiencies, or wait a minute, I have a vitamin D deficiency. But I'm not just talking about nutrients. I'm not just talking about fiber, or protein, or good fats. Deficiencies come in other areas of our life, and deficiencies come in, come in from, we can have a deficiency in hope, or positivity, or uh, relationships that feel toxic, like you were talking about. And so I just really encourage people to think like, where is there deficiency in joy or connection, especially after the past year or so, like, where do I need something that will serve me? And that's the practice. It's really tuning into our needs and um, building the things around it, making the extra effort to uh, make those things happen. I know for myself, Jody, that like, I need, I need to feel inspired. And if I'm not tuning into like podcasts about other things or storytelling or, you know, social justice issues or even like cooking podcasts. I need that to inspire my thinking. And so that's part of my practice as much as being out in the forest, being with nature, being with my boyfriend, being, you know, all the things I make sure I make time for the things that will really address those deficiencies I might be feeling. That's part of my resilience practice. It's all the things. It's reading the book that you know, you know what? I used to read fiction all the time. Why don't I do that anymore? Little baby steps, practice. That's how we fuel our resilience. I love that. And there's one other thing you, you said to me one time, because we're a it's hard for me to ask for help. And you were once like, I got the baby and the groceries. And that was such a uh, accurate visual. It's kind of like I, I can carry heavy things at the same time. Can you speak a little bit to kind of support and the, the need for support and asking for support? Yeah, asking for support and knowing what kind of support you need. So that image for me, Jody, was always so interesting because I would be looking at couples where, you know, if we're looking at, uh, you know, cisgender heterosexual couples, I'd be looking at mom holding the baby and kind of like pissed at dad for not grabbing the groceries or grabbing the stroller or whatever. And for me, it was just a standard practice. Like I just had the baby and the groceries. It was a gift when the right person was able to grab the groceries or the stroller or the baby, right? Like it was a gift, but I had to recognize where it made sense for me to ask, where it felt comfortable to ask and where it wasn't the right person because I didn't feel in my integrity asking. So support is um, a tricky thing that also is very personal. Who do I want support from? What kind of support do I need? What makes sense for me? I know there were a lot of uh, desires from people to swoop in and support me after Isamu died, but their support didn't feel right. I wanted to get up and make the quinoa for breakfast. I wanted to do certain things. And so I didn't want that taken away from me. So it, again, it's tapping into what does support look like for me? Even if I have to pay for it, if I have to know that like it feels really good from this person and that's where I want it and I'm going to tune into what that feels like. But I think that we also put this pressure to ask for support and it's supposed that also is supposed to look a certain way. And for me, it looked a lot different. So I think it's those relationships and those networks on the matrix, but understanding that your way of asking for or needing support may be unique to you. Tune into what feels good. I love how you are giving everyone permission to kind of trust their intuition and meet themselves where they're at. Yeah, there's so much allowance we need in there. I, you know, I, when I'm telling you this story, I'm remembering what it's like to be around my cousins. And I have four cousins, 
three men, one woman. And the way they knew to like swoop in, pick Gilbert up, take him in the water, ride the waves with him, like it always felt so good. And it didn't feel that clean with other people when I would get support that I wasn't paying for. And so just recognizing what is it about that that serves me and the more I can identify that, the more I can get more of it. That's beautiful. Yeah, I know that the people that would uh, complain like, oh, this is so much work to help you or, or go ahead and gossip like, oh, I helped Jody today. I'm like, you don't get a gold star. Like yeah. we're, we're not playing this game. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there anything we haven't talked about that you would like to add? Um, you know, so much, Jody. but I really do think, you know, resilience is a practice. I think it's that backbone that we have to turn to when life is challenging, which can be every day in some ways. And in other ways, there are those big challenges. And for me, it's just constantly remembering to come back to what are the practices that help me to weather the storm, be that bridge that can take the weight, that can take the weather, all of it. So I think it's just a reminder to tune in to you and allow your ways to be what informs what resilience is for you, each of us. I love that. And can you share more about how people can find out more about you and your work? Yeah, absolutely. You can find us at fxnutrition.com. And from there, you can learn more about our clinic and the practitioner training and my podcast and all sorts of things. So fxnutrition.com. And you have a download if people want to go through the matrix, right? It's not through the matrix, but we have a download if you, especially if you go to the practitioner training and that's all you can find the direction there from the website. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for having me, Jody.